Good afternoon, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Ashwini Lakshmanan, and I have the honor of being uh, the chair of our CPQCC Education and Outreach Committee. And today is our first conversation circle after our Improvement Palooza 2023, um, entitled Self-Restoration, Revelation, and Relationships. Um, next slide. Next slide. So we are very fortunate to have um, a very esteemed panel of, of speakers today. <clears throat> we'll start off our, our session with Lindsay Demuse, um, who is a stress first aid navigator with Sharp Healthcare. And she'll be discussing the Sharp Healthcare stress first aid navigator role and resources, which is a very unique program followed by Crystal Keeling and Daphne Campbell, who are clinical nurses and care committee members at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. And they'll describe um, their care committee, which is focused on keeping staff morale high. And then we have Dr. Eleni Brooke, who's our chief wellness officer and attending physician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and associate professor of clinical anesthesiology and pediatrics at Keck School of Medicine at USC who'll describe what it's like to create a culture of wellness and inclusion. And then we'll have um, a 20 minute Q&A panel discussion moderated by Dr. Valencia Walker, who's the Vice Dean of Health Equity and Inclusion at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. And we'll conclude with um, Janine Bonert, um, a program manager at CPQCC, who'll describe next steps. So a wonderful, wonderful agenda. Next slide. Um, in terms of obtaining continuing education or CE credit for our nurses, um, it has been approved for live attendance for today's, R for today's session for our RNs, um, sponsored by the Perinatal Advisory Council Leadership Advocacy and Consultation PACLAC group. Um, so please go ahead and chat in your name to sign into today's session. And at the end, um, you must complete the evaluation to obtain credit. And so our QR code, QR code and link will be provided by the end of the session. Next slide. So we would encourage you to please participate in our Padlet, um, which is a virtual way to continue our conversations. Um, so our Padlet link is right here in the chat. Um, it's padlet.com cbqccip 2023cc1. Um, and Janine kindly including the link in the chat. Um, and to start us off, when you have a chance to just to start engaging with the Padlet, if you can think about what does your self-care practice currently look like? You'll see that you'll see that tab right at the bottom of your um, Padlet screen here. And if you could share some thoughts, that would be wonderful. And, and then we'll, we'll also have a closing thought as well. But feel free to engage with any of the, the tabs here on our, on our Padlet. Next slide. So our goals today are to discover specific strategies for moving into a state of flourishing to learn innovative approaches to increase staff morale, to identify key components around a culture of wellness at work with a focus on inclusion, and to provide opportunities for interaction and sharing of wellness experiences. Um, and I think we would like to record the session um, if possible. So Janine, whenever you're ready, we can go ahead and record. Um, and with that, <clears throat> we can go on to the next slide. And um, I'll turn it over to Lindsay Demuth, um, who's, who's been kind enough to join us today. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Thank you so much for having me, Ashwini. I appreciate it. Okay, Janine, you want to click the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'm Lindsay Demuth, as was announced. I'm the licensed marriage and family therapist in the role of stress first aid navigator at Sharp Healthcare. And I'm honored to kick off this webinar by talking about restoring your professional purpose and well being through skills for flourishing in your professional role. Next slide, please. In this quick course, we will identify your experience with stress and languishing, as well as identify strategies to enhance a state of flourishing in your professional and hopefully personal lives. Next slide. 
But before I get into supporting you, I'm delighted to be able to spend a few minutes talking about my role at SHARP Healthcare as Stress First Aid Navigator. If you've never heard of SHARP, we are a major healthcare organization in San Diego County. And the background of my role is that it was created in 2021 in response to the needs of one of our hospitals, SHARP Chula Vista Medical Center, being that this hospital is very close to the U.S.-Mexico border and was affected significantly during the pandemic. So I was deployed to this hospital in a pilot role to provide provide on-site support through the use of the stress first aid model for our employees at Sharp Chula Vista who were critically distressed. And understandably, every employee at every hospital was critically distressed. This hospital in particular asked for support, and so we made it happen. Um, and for those of you that are unfamiliar with the stress first aid model, this is a peer support model that has been adapted many times over, but was most recently adapted by the PTSD Center through the VA. So despite being a licensed psychotherapist, I do not actually provide therapy in this role, nor do I provide patient care. Instead, I provide a variety of employee offerings, such as checking in through staff with everyday rounds, uh, being present for codes and debriefing after critical incidents and other challenging situations, be and ultimately in, uh, connecting our employees to Sharp's menu of employee well-being resources, such as EAP, Sharp Best Health, and other community partners. So upon my arrival at Sharp Chula Vista, our employees were so distressed that one of the most difficult things for them to do was actually pick up the phone and get connected to resources. So I was, and still in a lot of cases, am the person to be able to coordinate that. Since 2021, the role has gone from not only helping to stabilize the well-being of our employees into that of restoring their connection to themselves and the work that they do, while especially focusing on building resilience for future stressors. So I know I'm biased in saying this, but thus far, it's been a very successful experience integrating this role into Sharp Chula Vista. And it's just the beginning within my healthcare organization, and I hope healthcare in general. So I'm a team of me at this time, but the plan is for expansion of the Stress First Aid Navigator role to our other four hospitals within Sharp Healthcare under the employee well-being sector. So the primary element that I attribute to the success of this role is the relationships that I've worked so hard to build since December of 2021. I'm immersed in this community as a family member, not as a consultant. Referring to this picture on the slide, I'm just at the bottom on the left-hand side. Uh, this was taken about a month ago. And at first glance, you might notice that I'm an ethnic minority at Sharp Chula Vista, as the majority of our workforce are Filipinx and Latinx. What is not visible is that I'm a therapist Therapist and a person who, uh, before until I arrived in 2021, used to take things like openly discussing personal suffering in the workplace for granted. Uh, and this is just what happens, I guess, when psychotherapists work in close quarters with one another. Uh, at Sharp Chula Vista, however, I learned very quickly that many Latinx and Filipinx nurses have a very different relationship with showing emotions in the workplace as it relates to managing perceptions of strength and weakness. So the culture that I walked into was very much that of deal with it, don't let it affect you, and whatever you do, don't talk to shrinks. So I had a really steep learning curve ahead of me. Um, I initially, when I came on, just tried to make myself available in my office and would set, in, set up 20-minute what I would call check and connect sessions. I would rely on leaders to bring employees into my office to talk, and it really ended up being like employees felt like they were going to the principal's office. Uh, they were very reticent once they were in my office. They would apologize profusely if they started crying. And then if I saw them on the unit later, they would actively avoid me. So I realized that wasn't working and that if I was going to be educating people and demonstrating the stress first aid model, being that of a peer support model, that I had to be a peer even if I didn't have a medical background. So I realized that the more present I was around the hospital without agenda, the more people would actually warm up to me. And that's when they started spontaneously reaching out for help. So when I got invited to be in this picture, which is a group of all nurses, I almost cried tears of joy as this was a total actualization of the efforts to simply connect rather than to try to provide what I thought was mental health support. Um, this actually allowed me to be able to do my job effectively and meet the particular wellness needs of this incredible group of caregivers. Next slide. 
Despite not yet being a formal part of the employee wellness branch, I still work in close partnership with all of our employee wellness resources, such as Sharp Best Health, EAP, our ALs, spiritual care, our peer supporters, etc. And so for me, food and service are just naturally my love languages, and I jumped at the chance to be able to be a part of Tea for the Soul when I found out that Sharp Best Health and our chaplains provide this monthly at Sharp Chula Vista. And then also what I do in my my role anyways is I do um, evening rounding once a month and so this is a time that I will bring my espresso machine in. I post up in one of the units for a few hours and around 1 a.m. I'll start serving espresso drinks and both of these offerings I have found to be such a remarkable way to be able to connect with our staff. We all know that people love free food and drinks um, but this has been just such a way to be able to integrate myself into uh, the hospital as a, again, an, a member of the community rather than trying to push any sort of agenda and people have been able to really associate my role with that of a caring serving presence. Next slide. So enough about me. If we're going to talk about flourishing, we need to address the road that each of you are on. For anyone that's on the call that has worked uh, in healthcare in the before times, as I would say, you can attest to the experience of the pandemic being a journey and at times one feeling as if, if it's been never ending. For all of us, this has been a very long road. And at this point in the journey, the built up effects of the road may not be a matter of burnout, but more so a matter of the after effects of burnout. And by the way, if you're burned out and hearing the word burnout, then what I have to say is really for you. Uh, so I'm going to help you identify a snapshot of where you are now in your stress based on where you were. So I want you to think of three distinct times during your career. I want you to think of a snapshot of pre-pandemic, so just before 2020. Think of a snapshot of peak pandemic, so like the worst part of the experience for you and present. And what I want you to do is to rate your dedication to the work and your experience of burnout during each of those times. So your dedication to the work just before the pandemic and your experience of burnout and also um, during the peak pandemic and now. Next slide. Normally, I usually give a few minutes to do this, but we have to move at lightning speed. So I broke mine down for you as an example, and perhaps this is something that at least some of you resonate with. Um, so I experienced a high degree of dedication to the work during the pandemic, but I also experienced a correlation, um, a high, correlating a high degree of burnout. So moving into 2021, I was really struggling to my dedication to the work and the role that I used to be in, and I realized that I needed to pull over. For anyone that's been through all periods of time, uh, pardon me, oh yeah, all three periods of time in your role, in the same role, my guess is that your relationship to the dedication to the work has changed, even if an acute experience of burnout is seemingly in the rear view, in the rear view mirror. So what is that called when your dedication to the work starts to run out? Next slide. A good word that we have for this experience is languishing. Languishing is not a novel concept, but it was more recently written about in a New York Times article in April of 2021 by Adam Grant. In short, languishing is a sense of stagnation and emptiness. It's characterized by dissatisfaction, by a lack of engagement and apathy. You're not functioning at full capacity when you're languishing. Languishing can dull your motivation, disrupt your ability to focus, and research finds that it triples the odds that you actually Actually cut back at work. And I have to say that this is research that was taken pre-pandemic. So the hypothesis is that it's even higher now. Languishing is ultimately the void between depression and flourishing. It's this absence of well-being. It's not burnout and it's not depression, but there is a sense of joylessness or aimlessness. It feels as if you're meandering through life. And languishing does have real risks. It can put you on a future road to experience major depression, anxiety disorders, PTSD, for instance. If you think about it as being diagnosed as pre-diabetic, uh, how you handle it makes a significant difference as far as your future health is concerned. Next slide. 
So in terms of our workplace behaviors, you should be on the lookout for the following, whether it's in yourself or others. Maybe you're not as engaged or participative in meetings, huddles, or daily exchanges. So for anyone that's on the call, if you are heavily multitasking right now, then I'm speaking to you. Uh, perhaps you have trouble focusing on workplace tasks. Maybe you have difficulty finding motivation at work. People become less interested or tolerant of colleagues and or patients. Perhaps you're absent more often than normal or you're physically present, but you're mentally somewhere else. Languishing thoughts might be along the lines of, why can't I motivate myself to do more when I know that I want more? Or it's maybe I don't love my job. I don't hate it. I just meh. And that's really the word. It's this meh sense. So overall, we're feeling disconnected and unfulfilled at work. And it comes out as meh. Okay, next slide. So if languishing is on one end of the spectrum, save for suffering, then the other end is flourishing. So in contrast to languishing, flourishing is characterized by a sense of connectedness and engagement to life, relationships, and career. So if that's flourishing, how do we get there? Next slide. And very quickly referencing the stress first aid model, we can use four of the seven areas of the C's to be able to check, connect, build our competence and connect to our confidence to help you on this road to flourishing. And by the way, I'm so happy to invite myself to another webinar to talk more about stress first aid in greater detail if this is ever needed. Just putting that out there. Uh, next slide. Knowing that you are languishing first comes from checking in on yourself and doing it without judgment. So we want to acknowledge that we're languishing. We don't want to sweep it under the rug or minimize it, as perhaps some of you can relate to. Once we connect with the meh, it's important to really lean into that, whether it's just saying it out loud, um, you know, demonstrating it through song, dance, art, whatever it takes just to be able to recognize and embrace this current state that we're in. This isn't something that we want to shy away from because then we miss important opportunities to connect with a state of flourishing. Furthermore, noticing your feelings, thoughts, behaviors around the meh are helpful metrics to be able to gather so that we can actually establish a restoration plan toward flourishing. So right now the kitty is unwell and that is okay if we are too. Next slide. So next, noting, pardon me, Knowing your values, both who you are professionally and personally, can help us to see clarity on this journey of restoration. I believe that one of the factors that contributes to us losing our way is when we disconnect to our why. When we lose our anchor and we're not grounded to what's driving us, it's so easy for us to drift and to lose sight of our purpose. Next. So the following questions of reflection can reestablish our why and provide opportunities for revelation and restoration. So I want you to take a moment, look into yourself and to answer the questions that I'm gonna provide. So think about it. Why did you get into this profession? When, which picture came to your mind when you decided to go into this field? How has your experience in the field been like that idealized image? And conversely, how has it been different? Moving forward, how can you reconnect to the initial dream and desire that you had or connect to the picture of what it is? If there are disconnects between what's idealized and what's experienced, one way to be able to bridge this gap is to identify your connectedness to your core values. Next. So I, for, I unfortunately don't have time to be able to get in um, to this activity, but this is an activity that I put together that will help you navigate your answers to some of the questions that I just asked. Everybody has access to this worksheet in the webinar materials. I know Janine sent out an email with this link. And so I highly encourage you to take 10 to 15 minutes to do this. You will get such a return on your investment because this exercise can help you hone in on your core professional values and identify identify where you are versus where you want to be. And you can also change these out for um, personal values too. But taking the time to check in with your connection to your values is key in reinvigorating your connection to your why. Next slide. The competence part of the stress first aid model realizes that when we focus on 
restoring our competence. It's so important to be able to do that, uh, to fight off doubting or questioning our occupational, personal, personal, or even social capabilities. On one end, stressful experiences can cause us to doubt our abilities to learn and cultivate new skills. When we're in prolonged situations of stress where our competence is tested, this can plant internal seeds of doubt. As a response to prolonged experiences like that, you might start to say to yourself, maybe I'm not meant for this work. I don't even know if I can do this anymore. I should have known better. Why did I make this mistake? Moreover, when stress causes you to question your knowledge and your skills, your overall attitude about the work might shift as a result. So languishing can cause you to question your ability to do the job that you've been doing for 30 years, or perhaps um, after you've been working so hard to be able to, you know, achieve a certification or schooling, this can lead question, people to question their personal identities and purpose when they're languishing. Conversely, not having any novel challenges with appropriate learning, learning curves. In other words, if you're running on fumes in the monotony of a job that you've been doing for a long time, this can keep us in a state of, of languishing. Therefore, building competence helps you along this journey of restoring and discovering your purpose. Building competence is also one way to more fully live out your ideal or identified values. Next slide. So what comes to mind when you think about opportunities to build competence, whether it's mentoring, retraining in any areas where you're rusty or finally deciding to complete that certification that you might have been putting off, this is your official permission to shake things up. For me, focusing on incre increasing my competence help hedges against languishing because I'm not just cruising on aut autopilot. I'm always encountering appropriate challenges. Whatever sparks your thought process and how you might want to increase your competence, sharing these plans with others helps with your accountability and can also inspire ideas for them as well. Lastly, building competence outside of our professional lives can spark flourishing. For me, over the last year, I've been working on not only not killing plants, but actually <laughs> learning how to keep them alive and in a state of flourishing. And so when I go into my now makeshift solarium in my house, just to look around and see all the plants that are actually thriving brings me so much joy because I've developed this, this area of competence that I never thought I'd be able to do. Next slide. So confidence is the last element of stress first aid that I'm going to talk about on this road to flourishing. When we're faced with stress and overwhelm, our confidence in ourselves and others can certainly suffer. So if you think about it for a moment, we've been on this arduous road for years now. Perhaps you've witnessed coworkers quitting and you've felt the overwhelm of being short staffed. Perhaps you've witnessed leadership changing and you felt like there was no constant to depend on. Perhaps because you're tired, because you've juggled so much, because of the understandable brain fog that comes with time. You've maybe missed something, skipped something, or you've forgotten how to do something. Any of those, all of those would rock your confidence in yourself and the organization that you work for, perhaps. Therefore, it's understandable that our confidence, that our hope gets a bit sideswiped when we're facing and navigating stressful times. However, restoring your confidence is also synonymous with restoring our hope. Next slide. So in order to rebuild our confidence, we need to do several things that can be very helpful. First of which is just breaking down the areas that you're suffering. So instead of generalizing it and saying, I've lost all confidence in myself as a leader or as a clinician, break it down to what specifically has been disconnected from. Perhaps it's like, well, I just have been disconnected from my ability to encourage and motivate others. That is so much more specific. And that actually helps us to be able to look at that concern, identify what we can do about it if it's accurate or not, and then develop a plan for that. In the same vein, start to notice what you're saying about yourself at this point and moving forward, building your confidence, how that either contributes or reaffirms your self-doubt. So we have choices there. There's lots of information on self-talk and the importance of that. Um, Next is building your, your strengths. Studies have actually shown that a good way to be able to boost your confidence is not just focusing on building things from the ground up, but rather focusing on strengths that you already have. So I use this as an example. And sometimes I think we focus on like, well, I need to be in control in stressful situations, and that can be a recipe for disaster. So 
doing something like focusing on how well you did during, as far as effective communication is concerned during a crisis, this can be an actual much more achievable confidence boost that is aligned with your strengths rather than setting yourself up for the impossible. And being proud of your new skills, how often do you actually give yourself credit and a pat on the back? Or how often do you give others a pat on the back for newly obtained accomplishments? So taking a moment to be able to connect with the confidence that comes from new skills is such a great opportunity to be proud of yourself and to feel like you're flourishing. And then lastly, reminding yourself of your why, of the department's why, of the organization's why. I totally get it. We have, a, if we think about just what we've experienced in healthcare in general, there are a lot of opportunities to lament, but that doesn't necessarily help to instill hope. So instead, what can you tout about your team, department, organization, this collaborative? If I asked you to name the qualities about your organization that you have earnest confidence in, what would you say? How can you keep holding on to these qualities as inspiration for confidence? And then last slide. Putting this all together, we have the power to venture down this road to flourishing through checking in on yourselves, using that awareness to reconnect with our why, as well as revitalize our competence and restore our hope and thus our confidence. So with any presentation I give, I always want to end on a call to action. So I ask you, what are you going to do to move yourself from languishing to flourishing if you can relate to this? And then furthermore, what will you do to help others move from languishing to flourishing? I want you to make a plan and start with a step. It's just that easy. You don't need to develop the whole road, but that can be the first step that you've needed to pull yourself out of your languishing and feel alive in your journey to, in your journey to flourishing. And then just have one more slide. This is my contact information. Thank you so much for having me. If you have any questions after the Q&A later on, don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much. I'll hand it back to Ashwini. Thank you so much, Lindsay. That was fantastic. Now we'd like to welcome Crystal Keeling and Daphne Campbell. Thank you for having us. My name is Crystal Keeling. I'm a bedside nurse at UCSF. Uh, Benioff Children's Hospital and part of the care committee on our uh, intensive care nursery unit. Can you go ahead to the next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about our hospital. Um, we do have a new building that was created in 2015. Um, we are, our accolades um, are the best in California. We're number five in the nation for neonatology. Uh, we have approximately 60 beds and our ICN staffs uh, approximately 250 bedside nurses alone. Um, that doesn't include any other uh, multidisciplinary staff. Um, we are affiliated with the UCSF School of Medicine um, and we receive patients from throughout Northern California, Central California and beyond. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so to tell you a little bit about our committee, um, this is just a picture of some of the nurses on the unit celebrating New Year's Eve on the unit. Next slide. So a little bit about who we are. Um, the care committee stands for um, culture of inclus inclusivity, uh, appreciation, resiliency, and excellence. Um, our hope is to bring management, interdisciplinary staff and families together um, to implement initiatives through culture and build relationships. Um, when we have new staff come, up, come on board, um, we try to encourage everyone to join, be active with different committees that we have. One of them and one of our largest committees is the care committee. Um, and our main mission is uh, to, uh, for the staff to feel valued, supported, included, engaged. Um, and we want to, create a workplace of live collaboration and appreciation. Um, we provide integrative educational and support services for well-being, and uh, our hope is to strengthen all the efforts to ensure outstanding quality of care and excellence through patient experience. Next slide, please. So how do we do this? Um, there is a large group of care committee members. Um, just a few examples of this are providing a fresh orchid um, to staff members that we hear are going through a hardship or experience a loss. 
a personal loss. Um, we have a care, a care card box in our, our staff lounge that has an assortment of cards, everything from thank you cards, praise cards, uh, sympathy cards, just support cards. If we know there's a staff member that's dealing <clears throat> with perhaps a, a heavy assignment or a primary that um, you know is on brief, um, on um, not doing so well. Uh, we do everything from maternity leave gifts upon their return. We try to give little uh, gifts that hold uh, lactation support tea, a little chocolate, um, you know, little welcome back gift. Um, and then our main thing is we uh, provide our ICN holiday party. So we do a lot of planning and we execute that yearly um, with COVID. That was on the back burner a little bit, but we were able to provide funds for that yearly. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And um, this is just a couple um, pictures of our current, one of our current uh, things that we're doing on the unit that we just started a few months ago. It's called Tea for the Soul. And this is just a, a picture of Nurses Week. We go around with the cart providing tea, um, little chocolates, um, brownie bites, um, and just like a words of affirmation that we hand out. And if no one wants, you know, tea or vice versa, we always try to hand them a word of affirmation just to see how they're doing for the night and give them some <clears throat> positive words. Um, something else that we try to do to raise funds for a lot of this are um, seasonal raffles, um, discounted. We also do discounted tickets to uh, local and professional sporting events. We have the San Francisco uh, Giants that we uh, have planned monthly outings in the spring when they're performing. Um, we recently tried to get together for the Next slide. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes. Sorry about that. Um, and then one of the things we try to do to form our relationships in the on the unit, um, as I spoke to our holiday party that's annually in January out after the holidays. Um, we do meet and greets with newly onboarded staff and our new grad residents. Uh, we do, it's called a new grad happy hour. Uh, we do personal check-ins among staff. Um, and then we are very fortunate that we have a healthcare system and a unit uh, management that provide monthly hours paid to us to meet um, for our meetings and to provide uh, those hours. Next slide. Uh, one thing that we try to focus on in the Care Committee for Fostering Excellence that helps uh, us bond with parents and, and provide you know, little things for them is we create seasonal and holiday mementos for families. So here's a picture. We did a onesie, um, a onesie uh, competition. And so we hand out onesies to, and puffy paint to the different zones in our unit. And we come up with creative little ideas on how to, you know, decorate onesies and parents actually participate in these as well. Um, this is also an example for every holiday that we, we have, we try to um, create a holiday footprint uh, artwork for the parents. So this one says bone to, bone to be wild. Um, and then this helps build the relationships between nurses and families through just simple arts and crafts on the unit. <clears throat> Next slide. And then I'll pass it off to my colleague, Daphne. Hi, thank you for having us. So our committee is pretty broad. We cover a lot of um, our culture and our unit. 
helping our staff feel supported as well as you saw with our pictures and arts and crafts with our families. And so funding this sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. Um, and also just keeping active members in our care committee and making sure that we're kind of up on the next holiday, um, making sure we have a plan for each one of these events. And so some of our challenges are just innovative projects, making sure that we're kind of not becoming too stale. Um, and we have quite a few members on our team that really come with great ideas and it's great how much interaction that we have and we'll hear little things from the unit. What's the care committee doing now about, you know, what are they doing for Father's Day? Um, and it's very helpful to have just the input and a lot of the team, I noticed our colleagues, they'll kind of ask their question posed as, what's the care committee doing? Um, and they'll come with their ideas where instead of it's like, what are, what are you doing? Um, and I love that because I feel that it's a very much a, um, a group help and group thing that we're doing. What are we doing for the families for this day? What are we doing for um, Thanksgiving potluck? Are, are we providing the turkey this year? And so I think that's really great that it's a great um, group that everyone feels really they can trust with their questions and things like that. A lot of our wins are event outcomes when we like to go to, like she said, the Giants and the Warriors, but also we'll go to a local, um, we have a food truck place, which is so fantastic. It's like a large area with a bunch of food trucks. And so people will meet up and have like a happy hour there. And that's a really good turnout because people really enjoy finding new food together as well as just the um, camaraderie of hanging out and it's very close to work so that's wonderful for us our team can just all meet um, this canary committee i really feel personally as one of the newer members in the last few years um, at ucsf i view this committee as really holding up the morale of our unit i really see people are invested based on some of these things that are happening that are not just work related and the check-ins are wonderful people really do check in on each other and it helps us collaborate with our leadership um, the care committee our leadership meets on our meetings and so if we have questions or we need support or sometimes they'll financially help us like with the um, turkey say for Thanksgiving or they'll financially help the care committee with um, some of the holiday parties. So that's really fantastic that we have that great collaboration. Next slide, please. So we fund it in multiple ways. We get creative as a team. Um, our snack heart is a huge part of our uh, funding and that's kind of um, my coworker and I, Mara, we work really hard on this to keep it going and it's been going on for a long time. We just kind of took it over. Um, we have a snack cart in our unit, it's kind of tucked away behind our desk and it is stocked right here. You can see, <laughs> see right to the left, all these snacks, all kinds of snacks. Um, and so if you're hungry in the middle of your shift, especially on night shift, you can swing by and get some chips for a dollar. Um, almost everything is a dollar. And then we do have some special items like new fancy coffees and some beef jerky. Those have been a new addition recently that are a kind of hot topic. And those are just at a little bit of a specialty spiff price. Um, and this really helps our team financially as well as a huge morale. It's so wonderful. You don't have to run to a vending machine. And I think it's really fun. I've seen other units come to our snack cart and rave about the different snacks that they can find. I think the other day it was stocked with a whole bag of gummy worms, like a large bag of gummy worms. And there were so many people who were so excited just to grab some gummy worms. So this is our, in the middle here, you can see our snacks uh, cart storage. And how we do this is we have a group of girls and, and lovely gents who will go shopping at Costco and fill up this cart for us. And then we just continue to put it out on the smaller cart for purchase. So it's a fantastic program. And I just really feel that it supports our team. Not only like you said earlier, Lindsay, with food, as well as um, just access service, knowing that you can just have that little bit of sweet or whatever you're craving, a salty at that time. I really feel like it helps. And then we also do these raffles, um, which are really fun. We're in the middle of ending a raffle right now for um, Nurses Week, and it's got like a spa card and like a nurse self-care package. And it looks really exciting. We were closing out that raffle tonight at like 5 p.m. And that'll help fund our unit. And so it's really fun. These We just kind of have a picture of the raffle and people kind of buy tickets and it's, it's a great little thing. We also do on, um, during Nurses Week and during other events, we do like a 
a raffle of all the people who are working that day. And there's like sometimes gift cards that are donated or sometimes our team will give us like $5 gift cards to our uh, cafeteria downstairs. And so those kind of things keep the shift exciting and fun. And we kind of run those behind the scenes. And that's, I think a really good portion of our morale and it keeps people happy at work. Uh, next slide. It's just a couple of our, our teams. We have our holiday party, which is a huge fundraiser for us, as well as a really uh, big satisfier on the unit. People look forward to it every year. And then you have the people who were actually working that holiday party. We made sure to spoil them as well that night. So that's really fun. Uh, people who did come to work that day also got pizza and, and fun signs and still had a great time. Uh, next slide. And that's all for us. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Daphne. I'd um, like to invite Dr. Eleni Brook um, to share her reflections. Hi, everyone. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit. Uh, so maybe on this slide to give you a, a one moment background is um, I'm a palliative medicine physician clinically. And at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, I'm our chief faculty wellness officer. And so uh, my part of my job is to really think about um, how do we bolster and improve overall well-being well -being and fulfillment for um, the clinicians who work here at CHLA. And uh, based on the Stanford model from WellMD, uh, we've changed it a little bit because the whole goal is to balance solidly on your three-legged chair, because we love three part things in medicine um, for fulfillment. And those three things that bolster us are practice efficiencies, which are those things where um, it's like the inefficient practices that happen in medicine that really bog you down. Um, I sometimes think about this as like, there's no toner in your printer, but yet you must print something. Um, the Wi-Fi drops in between two different parts of the hospitals, or perhaps it's, um, your order set is archaic and has 30 things that you never need to order, but you need to keep removing them every single time you do the order set. That's a practice inefficiency. Um, another thing is the culture of well-being. What is the culture that we work in? The culture uh, that I'm talking about is like the one of medicine, the one of your hospital or of your unit, your division. What does that really look like? What does that feel like? How does that... Um, include ideas of inclusion and belonging. Um, what, what version of yourself is it, uh, is, it, is it welcomed to be when you're at work? That's your culture of well-being. And then a little bit of what I'm gonna talk about today and what's been talked about is that personal resilience. And so I do hedge a little about personal resilience because one of the things I do wanna say is that both based on, you know, like I'd say eminence, personal uh, journey walked and now a published article from December of 2020, turns out that all physicians are more resilient than the general population. So this is not a problem that we are not resilient enough. So I, I wanna talk about how do we bolster, how do we show up as our best selves while also holding that this is not a talk about that if you just are your very best self, all of a sudden, all efficiencies will go away and the culture you work within will be perfect. Um, next slide, please. I don't do this alone. Um, caring for others and moving the needle on the culture dial takes a lot of hands to push. And so one of the groups that I'm really grateful and fortunate to work with is the CHLA Wellbeing Council. Um, there's two slides. So as you look at these names and amazing faces, these are a group of people that come from all the departments, um, all the medical departments at the hospital. So we cover anesthesia, critical medicine, radiology, surgery, um, path and lab medicine. Uh, we have our APP colleagues, um, graduate medical education, yeah. And then a smattering, I'm at a freestanding children's hospital. So then it's like within the department of pediatrics, there's multiple people. Can you go to the next slide, please? So you'll see pictured here as well. Um, and within this, we also have our representation from Schwartz Rounds. Um, I, I could imagine perhaps you're curious, like why, why is it only advanced practice providers? So I will say 
they and and physicians and psychologists and clinical scientists. So at our, my hospital, the area that I spend a lot of time, um, like thinking about the well-being are within those groups. But a lot of what we do is with a lot of collaboration through those who are who are charged with well-being of additional clinicians. Next slide, please. So I share this wheel. Actually, I love this wheel. Um, and this is the emotion. This is a emotions wheel. There's other ones. And I really love this because I think a lot of times we have different, we don't differentiate really well on our emotions. And we just come in and we're like, I'm angry, right? And then you're like, but are you angry or are you really frustrated? Perhaps you're actually feeling irritated. Maybe it's distant. Maybe actually you're just skeptical. Maybe you just like are worried that something won't go the way you're hoping it to. And then that's your main primary emotion. And we're not great at that. Or maybe you're just like, I'm happy. But we don't really think like, are you happy? Because actually you're feeling really optimistic or you actually are able to hold a lot of hope. Or the one that I like the most that I will say is when I know that I'm actually in a really great place is I can joke and I can feel playful. When nothing is funny, then I probably am not anywhere in that side of my wheel. And so I offer this to you. Feel free to do with it. Check in with yourself and go to the next slide. This is like the condensed version. And I really um, appreciate Lindsay Demus talking about um, psychological first aid. This is an idea from that, from Stress First Aid, that talks about the simplified stress continuum. So this is something you can check in with yourself every single day. I'll let you know, I, I mean, I live in Los Angeles, I drive to the hospital, and on my way, undoubtedly, I will hit a traffic light. And I take the moment at the traffic light to ask myself, what color am I today? And so the colors are pretty simple. Um, green is go, you're ready to help others. Uh, you are feeling positive and you're like in it to win it, right? Yellow is reacting. Maybe you're a little bit tired. Perhaps it's the end of your week of service. Maybe it is, you know, hour 11 of 12. And you're, you're responding to the demands. You're being as present as you can, but you're, you're tired. Um, orange is you're feeling the drain. Um, you are noting that you're feeling some senses of burnout, that you don't feel so fulfilled by your work, that you're per like, when I say like, like, this is nothing is funny. Like even funny jokes are not funny to me when I am orange. And then red is ill. Like you need help. You need help by someone who actually is a licensed uh, mental health provider. Uh, we are really reticent to see other people as red, and we are even more reticent to ever acknowledge within healthcare that we might be red. I appreciate that that is changing, but I also want to hold up that that is still the prevailing culture. And so it's important not only to you ask yourself, what am I right now, but also the people around you, what might they be? How can I show up for them? Because it really does take a community. The last thing I do when I ask myself, what color am I, if it's not green, which, which it isn't always green, um, I might think to myself, well, what can I do? What can I do to get like a little bit closer to green? Or what can I do to get a little bit out of orange into yellow? And sometimes that's like, maybe I need to keep my head down a little bit today because what I really need is like a good night's sleep. And that's, you know, a solid 18 hours away from the moment I'm asking myself. Next slide, please. The last thing I wanted to touch upon is the concept of empathy and compassion. And I think this is something that is, is like my, here's my, thank you for inviting me and welcome to my personal soapbox. Um, I have seen a massive uptick in education around empathy in healthcare professional schools, right? Um, except I would say potentially for those who are learning to become uh, licensed mental health professionals, they don't teach as much about empathy, which I would say is really great. But you know, doctor school, nursing school, respiratory therapy school, all of those schools, we really dig in in empathy because it's this idea that you wanna have a close and visceral understanding of somebody else's experience. You wanna literally 
feel with the person, take on their emotions, right? We want to take on the emotions of the parents of the babies that we care for in the NICU. We want to viscerally be connected with them. That is sometimes what we are teaching. But what I want to invite you to think about is perhaps there's a better way to bolster our own personal resilience. Next slide, please. And that is with compassion. Because you're like, well, what is compassion? Ah, oh, synonyms, same thing. So compassion is actually when we take one tiny step away from empathy and ask ourselves, what can we do to support the person who is suffering? We recognize their difficulty. We don't expect them to change. We don't expect the suffering parent to stop crying. We don't expect the grieving parent to stop asking questions. We just think, how, what is my way of helping in this situation? In that way, we're actually disconnecting like our guts from their guts. We are somewhat disconnecting our prime emotional state of our brains from their brains. This is not a mind meld. This is actually a step back into that caring role. Next slide, please. Because sometimes we believe that the way that we're going to show up into the room with our colleagues with our patients, with their families, is through empathy. I need to feel with you, right? Like if we're just more empathetic, the, the way that the difficult family is talking is gonna be easier. I won't get upset. Um, if I can feel more empathetic to my colleague, then I'm not gonna walk away frustrated and upset. And the thing is that turns out the evidence says, that's probably not true, that really it's about compassion, right? And this is not actually towards like your significant others, right? Don't, don't like go home to that person and be like, I heard that I should really just be compassionate towards you. Like, no, that person you probably should be empathetic towards. But it's the patients, the families, and often our colleagues that we need compassion. And it's this idea, like we know we don't pity them. We understand we're not supposed to have sympathy. It's not the like shooting down the hole, like, oh, that looks terrible, right? That's not it. And it's also not, I'm just going to sit here in your shoes. We're going to feel with one another. It's I'm here to help. So help takes that tiny mental step away to take in what's going on and understanding where is that part that I fit in to improve the situation. Understanding that how I might initially think I'm improving the situation may not be correct and I'll have to try again. And it's so much easier to come back with the try it again when we come from a compassionate stance, I'm here to help, versus we have melded our mind. So if my, my mind meld with yours is rejected, then there's so much more of me that's at stake. And this is a way to actually hold our own self-compassion, our own actually self-empathy holding within ourselves as sacred. Next slide, please. And so with that, just my little shout out, for some evidence-based ways for tools for your own toolkit. Uh, maybe in on the Padlet, you wanna take one or two of these to test out, to take a spin for the summer. So one of them is making social connections, create and join a community. If you're at UCSF, you should obviously be joining that care group with the UCSF nurses. Um, stay active, complete the stress cycle. Uh, one of the ways to actually get rid of some of that um, frustrating, upset energy is to let it come out of your body, whether it's through sweat, sometimes through tears, or maybe some through deep, deep breathing, but complete your stress cycle. Talk to someone. Really spending one-on-one -on -one with someone who you deeply care about and deeply cares about you has been shown to diminish stress and anxiety. Take up a mindfulness practice. Be in the moment. Yoga, meditation, deep breathing, grounding. Grounding is when you really note the, the um, connection of where your body is touching with gravitational pull, maybe on the floor, maybe against the wall, maybe lying down, maybe in a body of water. Um, I have a heart, I'll, I have a really hard time. Um, I'm, not a great, I'm not great at mindfulness. And because I'm not great at it, I sometimes struggle to even try because my brain has a tendency to go in a hundred different directions simultaneously that I don't always even notice that my brain has like flown off and I'm not concentrating on my breath. So I try it for two minutes and I can't even do it for two minutes, but I really try. 
Um, number five, hunt for the good stuff. Celebrate, celebrate your successes, share your gratitudes, hold on to the positives. Our brains are actually wired to look at the negatives because that has kept us safe, right? Like, oh, that thing's got big things. Don't let it bite me. Got to remember that. We don't have to think like that thing was cute and furry. It made me feel good because <laughs> that doesn't keep you alive. So you have to remind yourself, celebrate your successes, be grateful, find the things to be great about. And number six, I'll say this twice. Don't skimp on sleep. Okay. One more time. Don't skimp on sleep. Uh, we are all at a deficit of sleep. Sleep is what helps us brains functions, help us control our moods, helps our autonomic system. Sleep is the greatest medication. If somehow we could bottle sleep, it would make us all healthier, but we can't. So we actually just have to do it. We all do have to sleep. I tell myself this, the same thing. In fact, actually everyone in my house, including my children who interrupt my sleep, tell me that I need to sleep. Okay, next slide, please. Eat a healthy diet. Still eat yummy things, but just try to eat also a healthy diet. Um, recall the meaning and purpose. Hold your whys. Thank you so much, Lenny Dumus. Like answer your question. Hold your whys. Remember your whys. Use your senses. Take in a beautiful view. Squeeze a stress ball. Smell a flower. Find other scents. Listen to music. Do things with your whole body. Take vacations. This is like up there with sleep. Like take your vacations. Plan them. Go on them. It actually has been shown to boost your tolerance, tolerance for difficult situations and your mood in general. If you ever have gone on vacation or actively planning a vacation, it could be eight months away. It's still shown to help. So take your vacations, take time to laugh, like just laugh, find anything funny, laugh. And then last but really, really not least is get help if you need it or just think you might in the future. Whether it's therapy or counseling or coaching, get help. I wish the stigma was that people didn't get the help that they needed. And I hope that one day that's what the way it is. So please get help. Next slide. And so thank you. Thank you so much, Eleni. That was fantastic also. Thank you to all our, our very wonderful panel, Lindsay, Crystal. Daphne, Eleni, we appreciate your time and wonderful insights. Um, so I think we have um, we have a, a, a good amount of time for our Q and A panel discussion, and it's my um, my privilege to welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Valencia Walker. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. That went by so quickly, but it was so amazing and. Because I'm moderating, I said, I'm gonna take notes so I know exactly what to say. Um, but this was great. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for going through and not just talking about feelings, but for so many of us that are showing up today, we are looking for those tools that we can use. Now, I saw one really great question in the chat. And we might as well start with the hard stuff since we have some extra time. Um, so this comes from Dr. Powell. And I think we've already noticed this, that the overall heavy lift of talking about well-being and care and compassion falls on women. And some of that, of course, is driven by societal norms and the male representation is low. How do we engage our male colleagues? but to not just help, but also do their own well-being practices. And any one of the speakers can, can take that question. I don't wanna single anyone out. Um, maybe, maybe I'll add like a, a, a couple ideas. One is uh, seek them out and invite them. Um, and I, I think that that's the first step is if you know, so there are men on the wellbeing council here. Um, and part of it is was also like, I was like, we need diversity of all kinds um, uh, and including gender diversity. So I think that's one, seek them out. The other is, uh, you know, 
Um, there is a lot, there, there is data that says that women find, it improves our well-being to do things in groups with other people in community. And not that it's not the same for men, but it's actually just proportionally like more like, we get more boost from this, you could say, than men do. And so I would say check in with men to make sure that like they are also aware, like more men are actually more physically active sometimes than women um, in solo things. Like more women go to yoga things, more men ride a bicycle. And so I, I would just actually reach out. And I think the one place that I have found the greatest success of all manner of diverse involvement is actually pushing into practice efficiencies. Everybody wants to make things um, run smoother. And so that's a place to first to like draw people in that they don't think they're gonna have to hug anyone. I guess as a disclaimer, I actually, some of you know me, but like, I am not a very huggy person. I don't walk around the hospital hugging people. Like if you need a hug, I'll give you a hug, but I'm unlikely to spontaneously hug you. And I think you just need, we need to like dismantle that, uh, that idea that we're all sitting on in a group hugging one another too. So what you're saying is we can talk about how we made our feelings and emotions better by working together to making things more efficient. And without knowing it, we're having conversations about well-being. That's awesome. Did anyone else have any comments or thoughts on engaging men? Well, I would add, I think similar to how we talk about the presence of fathers, um, and I think that Dr. Brooke has also kind of touched on that with her response. Making it seem more inviting. Um, maybe everything doesn't have to be pink and yoga and, and things like that. It's because sometimes we don't realize how much we are leaning into those, those stereotypes as well. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. It comes from Dr. Patel. And I... I didn't want to assume that Dr. Patel was my Dr. Patel, but hi, Rico. Hi, um, hey, Dr. Walker, how are you? It's so good to hear you and see you on the call. And I love your question. So Thank her you. question for everyone who may not have seen it in the chat, I'm really thinking about mindfulness programs for parents and families of patients. And I think a lot of times we're quick, and I, if I'm assuming correct, incorrectly, Dr. Patel, please you know, clarify, but I think a lot of times we will recommend like the Calm app or, you know, we'll, we're quick to recommend an app or quick to recommend a resource outside of the unit. But sometimes just having an accountability partner that knows what you're going through and is sharing your lived experience within the unit. And so is there a way to bring mindfulness programs that help engage families, but also bring them together? Has anyone had experience doing work like that? I can briefly speak on what I've seen our uh, spiritual care services do for our families. Um, they call it Mindful Mondays. And so they meet in our family lounge and um, on the, in the ICN, but also uh, in a centralized location for all pediatric uh, uh, of all the different units. Um, they get together morning and night and they do I think it's like a 15, 20 minute mindfulness session. Um, and then we also have chaplains that round almost daily and nightly. They make it a point to just touch base and see if parents are available to do any meditation or prayer or whatever, uh, you know, suits them. And Crystal, if I remember correctly, you were talking about how you do your double expresses at night mm -hmm. as well. Oh, yeah. Um, and I think that's something else that we should consider. And I know you mentioned that your chaplains come around at night. We are a 24 hour unit, um, but so often all of our support services go away at night, both for staff and for our families. And so I love the idea that you've been really intentional about including that piece. And, you know, all of you, I think mentioned tea for the soul. And I'm, I, I believe at one of my prior institutions, Tea for the soul happened during the day shift and the night shift. Um, and so I think those are some other ways that we can think about where people need support and where people need resources, particularly for our families. 
you know, because not every family can be there, you know, Monday morning per se, but they would still benefit from that type of support, you know, having to travel from a long distance or having to come straight from work to the unit. So I, I think things like that and to see that we as physicians support them can be helpful. I visited one institution and they actually had the physicians write out prescriptions to the parents to participate in these types of activities because there was something about the physician saying this is a part of the care for your baby that really helped motivate families. Have you seen in any of the work that you all have done those types of efforts where it's kind of getting people to help each other show up? Go ahead, Elisa. If you, we may need you to come off. Okay, thank you. I'm so sorry. There you are. My name is Elisa Rodriguez. I'm a um, staff nurse at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital with Crystal and Daphne. I actually co chair the um, care committee. Um, and I was referring to uh, going back to the question about. Um, refer, uh, resources for parents. We actually have a parent liaison that is, I believe, on payroll in our unit. Um, and she is a mother that had twins, like 27 week twins in our unit at one point. Um, and she is very active with our parents. Um, she comes around, uh, we'll touch base with them. She provides and comes up with different um, things that they can do during the day instead of sit in a dark room all day and stare at their baby. Um, there's walks they do like every Wednesday. Um, they have also, we have a wonderful uh, music department. Um, she's also within that parent liaison department. Um, and she does like ukulele classes for the dads. Um, so we definitely have some resources for our parents um, and most of them participate. They will participate. We also have a, um, at UCSF, we have a, a family department up on our sixth floor, our family resource department on sixth floor, which is, um, there's like a business center there for them. They can get simple things like toothpaste, toothbrush, um, little things that they need. Um, it's also just a place for them to get out and um, be away from the bedside. Uh, and then we also have things like we provide meals for our parents. Um, I think the Ronald McDonald house during the day, and again, this is mostly all during the day shift, <laughs> um, but the Ronald McDonald house offers, I think, breakfast and lunch for our parents. So we have quite a few resources. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so Kitty Gay, I see you have your hand raised. Yes, ma'am. And, and thank you for uh, bringing up the Ronald McDonald House, Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you so much for all of this great information. I, I will say it's really important that um, I know social workers a lot of times are the ones that let parents know or grandparents know about the Ronald McDonald House and that they offer that they can get the meal or wash their clothes or God forbid, take a nap. Um, but, but a lot of times parents come from a long ways away and when, when a nurse or a social worker says, so how are you doing? You doing okay? Either they're so exhausted or whatever, they're not, they're not able to say, I need to sleep or I need to wash my chonies or, you know, I need to take a shower. And so to offer that Ronald McDonald house, if there's space, um, because I've, I've told people personally, and I'm, I'm not a nurse like many of y'all are um, on the floor, but I've told a lot of our families with your kids with special needs, when you go to this hospital, you need to ask because they're not gonna offer it. They don't offer it. Um, so, so that, or just having a bed that the parent can sleep in and to say, you can use the bathroom here in the shower. Those are just simple things that, um, little things that make a huge difference on the comfort level and the, um, the ability to keep on keeping on. But thank you guys for this great 
information. Katie, I think what you're talking on is what we even mentioned, right? That idea of intention, being intentional about what we offer is an act of compassion. And part of our role, right, as a part of healing is that compassion has to be, you know, jointly there with it. I want to pause for just a second. Is everyone able to use the reaction button to like raise your hand and lower your hand? Because I, I want to get a sense maybe of who people are and what people currently have available to them. Okay. So my first question is, you know, we've heard from maybe some places that are very well resourced. So where you may work or offer service or support, understanding maybe not everyone is specifically hospital-based, but many of you are, how many people have access to a social worker? Just raise your hand. That's a good number. It, it's not everyone, and I understand not everyone may be in a position where they need to have access. Um, when it comes to some of the additional resources, how many um, people, have, oh, so please put your hands down. And then for the next question, so beyond access to a social worker, how many people feel like they know what resources they can offer that would be supportive for families. And these could be internal resources where you are or external resources within the communities where your families are. Ready, thank you. Thank you for answering that question. Okay, now put, our, put your hands down. Um, how often do you feel, and now we're going to switch the trend of our questions a little bit. How often do you feel like you have to compromise your own well being to support the well being of the people that you are caring for? Sorry, have you ever felt that you've had to compromise your well-being because you're trying to support the well-being of your patient or family? Okay. I appreciate, you can put your hands down. I appreciate that honesty. And so, you know, one of the things that we talked about is are you recognizing your burnout? Are you recognizing your languishing? Are you intentional about your well being and your restoration? And so, you know, a question that I want to pose to the panelists is where do boundaries fit in, both from a professional perspective and a personal perspective? How do we kind of navigate and approach that in a space such as this? Well, we're dealing with patients that are some of the most vulnerable. And that's open for all of our panelists. I don't know if there's anyone that maybe wants to go first um, in speaking to it, maybe Crystal. Sorry, could you repeat the question? So I was just asking, you know, we were talking about the availability of resources, but also talking about how we, some people may feel they need to compromise their own well-being to support the well-being of patients and families. And so how do you kind of think about boundaries from a personal and professional perspective that allows you to do both, maintain your well-being, but also support the needs of those that you're caring for? I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fine line. Um, but I think that, you know, naturally just being nurses, we are very giving, very, we want to be very supportive. Um, but personally, I, you know, I'm, I try to make that connection, but I also have to, I know when I leave work, I have to leave work, at, leave it there and not bring it home. Um, and that's in a multitude of different, you know, areas, whether it be, you know, I had a heavy assignment 
and you know uh maybe i you know the parents are having a hard time coping and i was there for them in that moment but i have to turn it off when i leave because it's hard you know personally to take that home and i have children of my own and not see the struggle that they're dealing with and you know they have healthy children and um and they don't you know or some something along those lines thank you for that lindsay did you want to add anything certainly yeah and i can speak from you know a professional experience as being a therapist and then just you know from my vantage point in this role i think sometimes it's so subjective and unfortunately sometimes it's really trial by fire because we may not realize that we need to set a boundary until it's been crossed and for some of us um you know, I can personally test to just, you know, that caregiver spirit of like wanting to be present and, you know, just do the best that I can to help support others. Sometimes that boundary gets crossed over and over again, and then I'm depleted. And I'm like, oh gosh, like this is because I'm overextending myself. And so, you know, for me and for the staff that I support, I noticed that one of the things that comes to mind when it relates to identifying that we're overextending ourselves is when we have a false sense of control. When we are realized, when we're recognizing that, you know, we thought, we think that we can do more than we actually could have in a situation. And so, you know, um, piggybacking on to what Crystal was just saying, I think that that's like when we take things home with us, it's natural that we do that, of course, but when I notice either myself or others that are ruminating about a situation that didn't work out, that perhaps there were safety issues that came into play um, or something really just did not go as planned, usually where we have to really make that boundary is like, wh when did I do the best that I could? In what areas was it set up for me to be able to you know, provide the best type of uh, care possible? And where are the areas that I really didn't have control over this? And how can I let go of that? I think what I see that's very emotionally challenging for people is where they continue to have this um, extreme sense or this um, you know, black and white sense of like, well, yeah, but I should have done everything. Well, how could you have done everything? First of all, you're not operating operating individually. We have a whole team that's available, um, but there's just this like really relentless sense of striving for excellence. And sometimes I think that that's the boundary is we have to really check within ourselves of what is possible as a human provider that we can do and what are the things that are outside of control that we can't do and how can we really reconcile that? And for me, that has been just such a key factor of removing my myself and not taking things with me to the point of exhaustion. And I try to implement that with the people that I support as much as possible, sometimes very successful and sometimes not very successfully. I really appreciate you saying that. So I'm going to ask one more general question. And then we had one question that was submitted prior to that I'd love for us to get into. Um, I know I said, ouch, a couple of times <laughs> doing the presentations, and I will confess, and others may or may not agree, but the idea of sleep um, and the necessity of sleep, I am definitely someone who struggles with that. And I'm just curious, you know, we often work long shifts and difficult shifts. How do we kind of help the sleep thing go a little better? Um, well, maybe I'll give a few things to think about. One is the, um, I think it's actually correlates to boundary question. I think you have to ask yourself, um, as opposed to like, what more could I do right now? I think you have to ask like, am I living in a self-sustainable way? Like you are your own finite resource. It's really hard. Like, okay, we're healthcare providers, like our, whatever we are, this, we're not good at this. And um, so in sleep, I think it's the same thing. It's, am I, I think you have to ask yourself, like, why am I not sleeping? Is it because I don't think I have the time to go to sleep right now? Is it that my body feels so keyed up that I like can't fall asleep right now? Um, and so I think you need to first do that and I'm, I'm happy to like stick in the chat quickly um you can like test your own sleep inventory like what is your sleep issue um i can be vulnerable with all of you my problem often is that like i just need to get that 
one more thing done, which quickly turns into three more things done before I'm allowed to go to sleep. And what I've really tried to do um, transparently only since January, and I'm not doing great, is to like try to tell myself in that moment when I say to myself, I only need to do this one more thing to ask myself, like, am I actually going to be super efficient at doing this thing right now? Or if I tried to go to sleep right now and I probably would fall asleep, can I do it tomorrow in a more efficient way? So that's, that's like just one question I've tried to ask myself. Um, and and I, I will say like, there are things that I'm like, oh, wow, this is probably going to take me like <laughs> really 10 minutes tomorrow. But if I try to do right now, it might take me like 45 minutes because my brain's tired. And then you have to ask yourself. And then, but I, I do think we have to ask ourselves, like, is it, because if the answer is I won't fall asleep until this is done, that's a, that's a different thing. So I would say like some of it is like your regular sleep hygiene. How bad is that since you've gone through healthcare training? Like how much did you ruin it? And where, how much do you need? It's like rehab, like haven't run a 5k in a while. Don't go run a 5k tomorrow. Don't expect that's going to happen. So how much of that? And then it's that part of, can you, can you be more effective if you let yourself, you let yourself sleep and then being a little bit more honest with ourselves. I love that. And yes, if you can put that sleep in between the chat, I, I saw, you know, a lot of people are off camera, but I think I saw a couple of little smiles and head nods um, in reaction to what you said. So I mentioned, you know, we thought this is going faster than I thought, um, but we did have one question that came up online. And so before I ask the question, I just want to make sure that we're all kind of starting from the same place of understanding. Um, please raise your under, raise your hand if you understand what a microaggression is, like the definition for a microaggression. Okay, we have a lot of people that are raising their hands, so that's good. I'm just going to briefly try to describe that and you can put your hands down and I'll give other people an opportunity to chime in as well um, if they like so that we can have a, a brief discussion around this question. But the idea of microaggressions is that if you think about a continuity, we've talked a lot about scales and continuums just today, like from the worst to the best. And that can be the same for civility and how we um, treat people. Um, and so you can go anywhere from being perfectly kind and respectful and inclusive and thoughtful to being the person that is like the worst jerk in the world. And there's the continuum between those. With microaggressions, these tend to target groups that are usually marginalized because of an identity. And there are the little slights and insults, but sometimes there are things that are also very overt and aggressive. Micro can be misleading because it's not always micro in the way we think of small, but it's micro as compared to burning down someone's home or lynching someone which the term microaggressions entered in the literature in 1970s. So there's a little bit of historical context to that term. But the question that was received is, when you're trying to maintain your well-being, how do you do that if you're facing microaggressions on a daily basis and or you have real concerns about how that treatment is affecting safety in the environment? Um, so, I'm not sure, maybe I can go back to Lindsay, if you wanna um, start or in your thoughts or reactions to that question. As far as safety in the environment is concerned? Yeah, and just kind of managing, if you feel like you're in an environment mm -hmm. where you're being insulted or mistreated in this form of microaggressions. 
Hmm. This is such an interesting and timely question. And again, I touched on this in my presentation of just recognizing um, different cultural um, influences in the work that I do and noticing that I take a lot of things for granted as a white woman. Um, and so I learned about microaggressions a long time ago and had presented this to our leadership team because I just noticed that this was something that um, I needed to be much more aware of and to be able to provoke, promote this um, awareness to others as well. Um, and so the the thing that I notice uh, in our hospital system, being that I work with a lot of Filipinx and Latinx um, nurses, as I said, is that um, there we take, like I said, I take things for granted. And um, when I recognize that there are as we're starting to have family members come back into the hospital, this is something that is much more disruptive and can really influence the uh, staff sense of safety. And so what I guess the only thing that I can say is I do my best to really try to recognize this, to provide um, awareness and to really check in with staff if I notice that they are experiencing this on their end, because the best thing that I can be is an advocate. The best thing that I can be is really attuned to this and to create space to recognize this so that people feel comfortable speaking out. Thank you so much for that response. Did any of our other speakers want to touch on this? We have about one, one or two more minutes before I have to turn it back over to the leadership team. I will say the one thing I will add, and, and I appreciate what you said. One is to validate what you're experiencing. Often there's a gaslight phenomenon where people try to say it's not really like that. I think that's important. I think for people that are learning about microaggression and trying to understand them, when people come to you and they say, this made me feel this way, or this is how I experienced it, you don't have to perfectly understand it, but it's so important to listen and say, I wouldn't have known that if you hadn't shared it with you. Thank you for letting me. And as you start to see patterns, recognizing where there are opportunities for improvement, because microaggressions do make the environment less safe and less efficient, which then affects everyone and can kind of contribute to the overall culture and environment. It's a really big question and it's an important question. And similarly, maybe we'll invite ourselves back to kind of speak to that a little bit more. Um, so now I think I'm gonna turn it back over to Janine. And Kathy, I apologize, I didn't get to your question, but you all can absolutely send us questions after the fact. Um, this is the, you know, a series, and we're going to follow up on these issues and really try to tie it all together and tie it back to what we learned at Improvement Palooza this year. Thank you, Valencia, and thank you to all the speakers today. Um, we really appreciate all of the information that you gave. Hopefully, um, the participants today are walking away with practical tips that they can bring into their everyday lives um, at home and work. So thanks again. And um, just a few quick things on next steps. Uh, we shared the Padlet at the beginning of today's session, and we would love for you to comment now or later on what you plan to add into your self-care practice. After attending today's session, we have the um, link in the slide there, as well as I'll put that in the chat. Um, so feel free to share with everyone. We'd like to continue the conversation that was started today. Um, I also put the evaluation link in the chat for you. We'd love to hear your feedback on today's session. We're planning more of these, um, so we would like to continue the conversation started today. Uh, we have future conversation circles planned for hopefully September and early next year, so we'll be in touch on that if you're on our mailing list. And you can also go to the Improvement Palooza 2023 page where we'll post future sessions. So we really appreciate you attending and thanks again to all of our speakers today. Thank you so much, everyone, and for all your hard work on this program, Janine. Thanks, Ashwini.